I was told that I needed to have an icebreaker for this talk, so, so here it goes. People ask me how I got involved in quantum, and the answer is probably gonna surprise everybody here. It started back when I was in college, but it wasn't through coursework. I wanted to become a cop. I graduated from college, I took the police test, and I ultimately wound up getting disqualified because I had to take out my contact lenses to take the eyesight requirement. I failed that test, I got rejected, and um, didn't know what to do. I had no other plans. So I applied to a graduate program. I figured I would buy some time. Little did I know that that time would have been very expensive and I would still be paying for it today. That graduate program was a PhD program in behavioral neuroscience, and that was when I was first exposed to quantum. I was measuring cortical responses in the human visual cortex using a technique called visually evoked potentials, which is a type of EEG. I had to learn about how photons were being absorbed by the human retina. That was when I started learning about some of the quantum phenomena, such as entanglement and superposition, as well as um, double slit experiments. And I have to admit that it was some of the strangest things that I've ever heard of. It was pure science fiction, but without the fiction. But it sparked an interest, and I kept on reading and reading and reading. And I eventually, eventually fell down the quantum rabbit hole, spending more and more time reading quantum than I was behavioral neuroscience. So make a long story short, if it wasn't for me failing the eyesight requirement, I would never have went to graduate school, I would never have been exposed to SAS or quantum, and I probably would have retired 12 years ago. So now that the ice is broken, what are we gonna talk about? I'm gonna discuss with you guys a little bit about SAS and who we are, our history with quantum, what we've been doing, we're gonna discuss a couple of problems, but we're gonna focus on one in particular called the kidney exchange problem. And then finally, we're gonna talk about a little bit of conclusions and future directions. So for nearly 50 years, SAS has led the way in data and AI. We've been at the forefront of AI and analytics and innovation, creating solutions for customers for um, increased time to value. Some of these include speeding up medical discoveries, predicting fraud, optimizing operations, and enhancing risk assessment. As the founder and future of AI, we're very excited for the potentials that quantum might bring. We started looking at quantum formally about two years ago. And at that time, we didn't really know much about quantum computing, but we needed to explore the different modalities. So we started looking at things like superconducting qubits, ion traps, neutral atoms. We needed to understand the strengths, the weaknesses, the limitations. We also decided that we needed to understand the various methods of quantum computing, such as quantum annealing, as well as quantum gates. And again, understanding the strengths, the limitations. We decided at that point, upon researching this, to go down the path of quantum annealing largely because it seemed as though quantum annealing for optimization problems was the most mature use case. And it also represented a low hanging fruit. So we implemented a phasic approach. The first phase it was we took a series of internal SAS optimization problems that we used to test our own classical solvers and we ran those against the quantum annealing solvers and we compared the results. We needed to see what problems were good, what problems were not so good for quantum. In the second phase, we took larger real world type of problems. Those problems we already had solutions for, we've solved in the past, we knew the quality of the solutions and we knew how long it took to solve them. We ran those against quantum annealing. So you could think of phase one and phase two really as a learning process. We needed to understand the, where quantum would fit in. In phase three, we thought we had an idea of where this was and, and, and what the problem types were. So we took two large real world type of problems and these problems actually won the Nobel prizes in their respective fields. The first one is called the kidney exchange problem and that's what we're gonna speak about for the rest of the talk. 
And the second one was a Nash equilibrium problem. We spent, like I said, we were looking at different models and different methodologies, and we were looking at different types of problems. I've already spoke about optimization, and that's where we spent the majority of our time. But we also took a look at financial modeling around um, risk and portfolio optimization. We took a look at machine learning around quantum classifiers, neural networks, feature selection. And then we took a look as well as um, chemistry and biology around molecular modeling and protein folding. So I mentioned before that we went down the quantum annealing path, and I think I need to justify that a little bit more instead of just saying that we did it for optimization. When we were researching quantum annealing, we quickly found out that it really was at the time, and still is, the only real technology out there that is capable of natively running real world commercially sized optimization problems. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about for us, right? We, we wanna add value to our customers sooner rather than later. In addition, we have a relatively large optimization practice and we have a lot of optimization experts. So when we're formulating these problems and these sort of nebulous ideas, and then we have to formulate mathematical constructs, and then we have to create the programs to run them and look at the results in classical in SAS optimization and potentially reformulate them to run in quantum, we need optimization experts to do that. So having these optimization experts um, is very important to us. In addition, when we were taking a look at the software development kit for quantum annealing, it actually was very similar to our SAS optimization. The syntax was different, but the methodology of programming it was very, very similar. You define objectives and constraints and penalty functions. That reduced the learning curve basically to almost non-existent. And then finally, the fact that it's open source in something like Python makes it very, very easy to integrate into our SAS via product offerings. So from here on out, we're gonna talk about the kidney exchange problem that we worked on. And it's important to point out that currently in the United States, there are 100,000 people on the kidney transplant list waiting to receive a kidney from a deceased donor. That's a big problem. And it's partially addressed by this program called the Kidney Exchange Program. And this Kidney Exchange Program actually won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2012. It's also been featured on popular TV shows such as The Resident and Grey's Anatomy. We've been able to implement a novel hybrid process utilizing quantum annealing solvers as well as classical solvers in what we call might not be the most original name right now, but it needs some work, the two-stage process. So let's walk through a concrete example. What is a kidney exchange? In a donor pair, there is a recipient that needs a kidney and a donor that is willing to donate his or her kidney to the recipient. However, about one-third of these transplants are not compatible. So how do we get around this? We could take a look at donors and recipients that are incompatible with each other and might be compatible um, with other people. So for example, donor one might be compatible with recipient two, and donor two might be compatible with recipient one. This is what we call a, a two-way swap. And it's a feasible swap because of the compatibility. This is also the core behind the kidney exchange program. What you see up here is an example network representation of the exchange program. Each node in this graph represents a donor pair. And it's important to see how interconnected all of these nodes are. So there's a lot of possibilities. This graph has 200 nodes. Each arrow represents a compatibility between a donor from one pair and a recipient from another. And it's also important to notice that each arrow also carries a compatibility score. The higher the compatibility score, the better the success rate for the, for the transplant. In this example, we've randomly generated compatibility scores between zero and two. Here's an example of a compatibility score 
of a two-way swap with a compatibility score of 2.427. This is similar to the swap that we just discussed before. Multi-way swaps are also viable. In this instance, we have a nine-way swap with nine donors with a total compatibility score of 11.472. This is also called a chain of swaps. And these chains can be quite long. In fact, the longest recorded chain in history happened in 2015 in the United States with staggering 35 transplants. These multi-way swaps are important because they encompass about 20% of the transplants. So let's talk about the model formulation. Our objective is to maximize the compatibility score of the selected swaps. But we have to do this in the confines of a set of rules or constraints in order to ensure the feasibility and safety of the exchanges. For example, a donor pair can only participate in one chain if they are selected. Additionally, a donor pair can only donate once and a recipient can only receive once. And it's also very important to look at the length of the chains. Now that might seem, seem counterintuitive. You would think with longer and longer chains, you would you know, traverse a larger and larger network and have more and more possibilities. But the longer the chains, it also in introduces increased risks. So we have to balance this. We have to balance the risks and the chain length to get the best possible swaps. So when we run this in SAS optimization, which is a classical solver, we get a solution, a feasible solution, in one second. But that's far from optimal. It's only 3.3% optimal with a compatibility score of 9.497. Now, as we allow the solver to continue to run and um, make the solution better or refine the solution, at 20 seconds, we're at 96.6% optimal with a compatibility score of 28.277. Now, I want to point out that if you look from one second to 20 seconds, you'll see that we're gaining large amounts of optimality. We're becoming more and more optimal in short durations of time. But at 20 seconds, that changes. At 180 seconds, or three minutes, we have a compatibility score of 28.78, and we're 99.4% optimal. Now, this is that change I was telling you about. From 20 seconds to 180 seconds, we're seeing very, very small gains in optimality over large durations of time. So you can imagine if you were to extrapolate this out and try to achieve an optimal solution at 100% optimality, it could take quite some time. How do we, what's one way of dealing with this? Well, we could, feed, we could start with a seed solution or a starting point that we could feed into our classical solver. And this starting point helps reduce this amount of time. And this is where the quantum solver comes in. When we run this in quantum, in quantum annealing, we see a very different process. We get 101 samples, or 101 solutions. Of those, 28 of them are feasible. What's amazing is this entire process takes us about 14 seconds to run, of which 0 0.016 of the second is spent in quantum time or they're on a QPU. The 90, other 99.9% of the time is spent elsewhere, pre and post processing on classical resources such as CPUs and GPUs. So when we run this on the quantum annealer, the best solution, the best feasible solution that we get has a compatibility score of 23.667. So what do we do now? Well, we take these quantum solutions and we use them as the seeds or starting points, and we feed them into that class, into our SAS optimization. Now, I just want to just digress a little bit, because I think that when you're explaining something complex like quantum or optimization, you need to explain it in ways that are easy to understand. You don't want to get all, you know, throughout formulas and theories and stuff. And it just so happened that when I was working on these slides, my son comes into my office and he hears me you know, rehearsing in my office. He's like, Dad, what are you talking to yourself about? And what are you doing? So I'm showing him the graphs. I'm trying to explain to him you know, a little bit about quantum, a little bit of optimization, and how you take one solution and you feed it into another to maybe get a better result. And he's like, 
I'm like, do you understand what I'm saying to you? And he's like, yeah, this is easy. I'm like, oh, you think it's easy. So why don't you explain it back? And he's like, cheat codes. You're using video game cheat codes. And I'm like, okay. So he was, I was impressed that he was able to take something complex and put it into a frame of reference that he understood. So when we take these cheat codes from quantum and we feed them into our classical solver, we get this result. We're able to achieve 100% optimality in 30 seconds. Now, if we take a look at, and we compare the two, with an initial solution, 30 seconds, 100% optimality, without an initial solution, using classical only, we fail to achieve optimality after three minutes. So the benefits are clear. And this was an afterthought after I created the slide, so you have to excuse me. If you take a look, and, but it's important, and we'll come back to it later. If you take a look at the five second mark, on the, with the initial solution graph, it's easier to see, but on this one, you'll have to use your imagination. Along that y-axis, if you take a look at the five second mark, and you move over to see what percent optimal you are after five seconds, in our two-stage approach, it's around 90% optimal. In the classical only, you're maybe eight or nine or 10% optimal. Now just remember those numbers, five seconds, 8% and 90%. We're gonna come back to it later. So earlier I mentioned we get 28 feasible solutions. Now we don't know which one is going to give us the same results that I just showed you. Some of those might give you the optimal result in a short amount of time, and other ones might not. Luckily, in, in SAS, we don't have to choose. We're able to take all 28 of these solutions, and we're able to feed them all in parallel into SAS via, and run them in a, a parallel process, and then get 28 results. And these 28 results, some of them might be optimal, and some of them might be close to optimal. For us, that's a really good thing. Because our model, remember, is maximizing the total compatibility score. But when you're dealing with healthcare or hospital workers, their criteria for choosing a solution, though total compatibility score might be important, but they might have other criteria. And if you think about like, that type of setting, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an evolving setting. And by providing 28 good solutions, some being optimal, some being close to optimal, you give healthcare providers the ability to choose the best solution that they want to use based on their criteria at that time. So we spoke about a number of things. We saw that our two-stage process is significantly faster than classical alone. Imagine being able to reduce the length of time people have to wait for kidney transplants by being able to traverse larger and larger networks in shorter amount of time. We've already said that multiple solutions is a good thing. And remember I told you, remember those numbers, the, f the five seconds, the 8% and the, and, the, uh, and the 90%. When we're reducing the gap or we're increasing the optimality or the proximity to optimality, there are times that you might not want to wait for that 30 seconds or that minute or whatever time it takes. A good example would be real-time vehicle routing. I mean, I don't know if it's happened to you, but I'll be at a light and I realize I have to go somewhere and I'll try to put something in, into the map and then the light turns green and then the whole screen locks up. And I can't touch this until the next light or I pull over. So sometimes you might want to stop the solver way before 30 seconds, maybe at five seconds. And knowing that you're 90% optimal after five seconds is very beneficial versus knowing that you're only 8% optimal. And we've seen that it's very, very easy to integrate into SAS. We were able, the way we, we did a lot of this is that we would call the quantum annealing solvers directly from our SAS environment and have the results returned for further processing within SAS. Next steps. We're gonna continue looking at optimization. 
we have a subsets of problems that the two-stage process works very, very well with. Um, we're going to look at other optimization problems and other ways of, of combining classical and quantum solvers in a hybrid way. This two-stage process was good, but maybe there's other ones out there as well. We're going to dive deeper into machine learning and AI. We're going to dive deeper into biology and chemistry. And finally, and probably the most important, is that we're going to really spend a lot of time looking at integration points with our SaaS offerings. For our customers, we want to be able to supply them another tool in their toolbox to solve very hard analytical problems. In this case, this tool is quantum. But we don't want them to have to take quantum physics courses to be able to do this. So that brings us to an end. Um, Justin, who is our program manager, and I will be here for the rest of um, today. If you have any questions, please contact us. Thank you.